Richard Kerr came to filmmaking from a distinctively Canadian background, having first pursued a career as a professional hockey player. Kerr became interested in making art, first through photography, which led him to filmmaking. After making a number of films that explored a poetic, observational style, Kerr began a series of long films that dealt with storytelling, journeying, and national myth. Nick did not watch. His curiosity had been gone for a long time. Inspired by the writings of Ernest Hemingway and by compositional and reportage traditions of photography, Kerr took images of home, of landscapes, and, as a tourist, of the territories and politics of America. Later, he would pursue self-consciously machined images and found footage. His work in filmmaking has been complemented by his work in sculpture and craft, specifically his motion picture weaving project, totemic quilts fashioned from interwoven strips of commercial film, their frames forming tartan patterns on wall-mounted light boxes. These boxes, a unique integration of the methods of folk art with the serial constitution of the film strip, represent the bulk of Kerr's activity in recent decades. Kerr's earliest films are works of cinema verite, Poxville to Wallenstein, a portrait of old order Amish farmers in southern Ontario in winter, a patient, at times meditative, look at their lifestyle, suspended in pastoral memory. Vesta Lunch, an exercise in stationary, observational, sync sound filmmaking, shot at night in an iconic, Toronto Greasy Spoon, and the more personal Canal, a portrait of the Welland Canal dedicated to his brother, a study of a place of our youth. His films moved in another direction with his first major work, On Land Over Water, Six Stories, an omnibus of six episodes, among them a dramatized reading, paired with visually fragmented text, from Hemingway. Non-narrative episodes that use improvisatory camera work and optical manipulation. And spontaneous stories from figures encountered on the road. Hey, Tony, about Jack? Jack was the heart and soul of the whole town. He'd be sitting talking to Jack and look at the clock and he'd say, Tempest Fugit. That's Latin for time flies, but it meant the beer store was closing. It was something else. You'd see him walking down the street. Boy, you knew you were in for something. He had stories I couldn't believe. Much of this work remains anchored in observation but it suggests the forms that will underscore Kerr's subsequent films, fluent transit between color and black and white photography, a mixture of environmental and human portraiture, interruptions of texts and symbols printed into the image, a porous sense of what storytelling can mean. He followed this with two more long films, the Last Days of Contrition, and Cruel Rhythm. Both are road trips through the final days of Reagan-Bush America. The Last Days of Contrition tours beaches, deserts, ballparks, and ruins in a stark black and white, using motorized tripod heads to create breathless scans of an unstoried desert. Radio broadcasts introduce a percussive march, a jingoistic commentary on American democracy, a collage of looping speeches. But now something's happened. There are those who say it's an opportunity to correct some of the wrongs in our society. Well, as one who fought for equality in this society, I'll tell you, 
My struggle was not so that we could all be equally enslaved. No, we are not all in prison camps. We are not all beaten down by an occupying army with tanks on every corner. But we don't need troops to tell us that we have lost our vision. The film ends with these forms coming together, Kerr's persistently spinning camera aimed at treetops as, in superimposition, military jets cross the sky, an omen of the end times. Cruel rhythm continues these gestures, with a more explicit emphasis on themes of militarism in American life. The soundtrack offers a survey distinct to the American social landscape. Dramatized military drills, the national anthem, cheers at a baseball game, official statements from military personnel. It is a hard heart to kill. To show our appreciation for so much power, we keep him. Against this, Kerr poses images that, at first, extend the observational qualities of the last days of contrition. But once color arrives in the form of a long, abstract sequence of animated, agitated palm leaves, cruel rhythm enters into a more violent, intensely abstract space. Elemental phenomena come and go, composed in the abstract, a backlit indoor waterfall, billowing flames. Kerr engages a rapid, mechanical movement that reduces palm leaves and landscapes to lines of light. From this emerges an America of fear and uncertainty, host to a blinding restlessness matched on the soundtrack by the sounds of war and the ponderous statement given by a reporter that something is happening outside. The final sequence of machined abstraction in cruel rhythm foreshadows a coming turn in Kerr's work, a total embrace of the camera's ability to abstract the photographic subject by force of motion. This work, influenced by Michael Snow's explorations of camera motion, disavows the narrative aspects that had played a persistent role in Kerr's long films to date. It also signals a departure from the photojournalistic qualities that had defined much of his work moving into a territory of difficult, experiential modernism. In three subsequent films, The Machine in the Garden, Plein Air Etude, and Plein Air, Kerr uses the camera, motorized tripod heads, and vehicle mounts to explore a new approach to environmental portraiture. Kerr is influenced by Michael Snow's La Région Centrale, in which a landscape is subject to an exhaustive, coolly mechanical survey of camera movement, but the resulting works have a plainly romantic quality to them, inscribed with a machine, but willed by a definitively human subjectivity. The title of The Machine in the Garden comes from Leo Marx, whose study of the same name drew from the motif in American literature of a pastoral setting disrupted by industrial technology. Kerr's film doesn't linger on the fraying of a tranquil range, but nor does it see only as a machine sees. The road opens up for it, a car-mounted camera passing through space. Car and camera become the carriage of vision, mediating and disrupting the scene. The plein air films, kinetic sketchwork, offer a bridge between Kerr's environmental themes 
and the post-impressionists, suggesting that the spirit of the landscape is felt more in the energy of receiving it, an energy that can only be expressed in the abstract, than it can be in the clean witness of bounded conventional composition. As with cruel rhythm, Kerr turns to the elemental, in fluid, violent, kinetic cinematography of water and earth. The plein air of the title, an allusion to the painter's tradition of working in nature, becomes the literal air that's broken by the force of the filmmaker and his camera. Kerr's impulse toward narrative and storytelling was not altogether abandoned. Rather, it led him to make The Willing Voyeur, a feature in the style of the new narrative, combining storytelling and dramatic structures with progressive, subversive, experimental forms. The Willing Voyeur deals in discontinuities, body bags, photo albums, overlapping voices giving stray, tangential observations. It's a film about the voyeur, both on screen and in the audience, and their violent desires. Why do we seek out violence? How do we document violence? What about it thrills and repels us? Where do thrill and repulsion overlap? Why do we study and remember it? Kerr withdrew The Willing Voyeur from distribution after a debut at the Locarno Film Festival. It marks Kerr's only effort in fiction filmmaking, but it also serves as a central rift in his work, distinguishing what had come before, disciplined formalism that paired explorative treatments of landscape with an obscure approach to narrative, with what would follow, a continuing embrace of the machine's wildest and most kinetic possibilities. After The Willing Voyeur, Kerr completed his first work in video, Never Confuse Movement with Action, the self-fictionalization of Patrick Hemingway, a postmodern biographical documentary about a grandson of Ernest Hemingway. Kerr explores themes of inheritance, addiction, and the author's exploration of the veil between fact and fiction. A subsequent lawsuit led Kerr to produce an alternative version. Human Tragedy on a Grand Scale, a remix that placed greater emphasis on the community of homeless addicts in East Hastings, Vancouver, that had also featured prominently in the original. Kerr's approach to working with video is present here as well. At times he uses a slow shutter to create staggered movements and often retains roughly truncated sound. Throughout both films, Kerr employs running horizontal scrolls drawn from emails a ticker abundant with information, a maximalist force-feeding of counter-narratives, sometimes deepening context, sometimes providing atmosphere, sometimes simply providing the eye with another place to look. He followed this with a pair of poetic documentaries focused on landscape and the transient nature of perception. Pictures of sound, in which interrupting, often grating sound is paired with elliptical edits of two landscapes, a mountain range and a water body. And I Was a Strong Man Until I Left Home, the most diaristic of his films since Cruel Rhythm, which also uses ellipses as a running strategy 
along with fades that indicate passing time, and much of which is composed in abstract images that use soft focus and extreme close-up, in tandem with the forward-moving elliptical cuts that draw the viewer through a series of hotel rooms, cityscapes, airports, airplanes. Kerr describes this approach as digital sketching, and he continued it in a universe of broken parts. and action study. All of Kerr's work prior to the turn of the millennium had focused on personal vision of one order or another, whether that personal vision was observational or abstracting, internal or external. In the early 2000s, however, he began to work with 35mm commercial movie trailers refashioning them into lightbox-mounted collages, but also working with them to create new films. This marked the start of his work in installation, culminating in Industry, a show held at the Cinémathèque Québécois in 2003 that included works from his motion picture weaving project, and his found footage films. In Collage d'Hollywood and Hollywood Décollage, he uses chemistry, paint, and superimposition to chip away at existing imagery and to fill in the gaps that he has dug out in a décollage mode. In Des Mouvements, a black and white collage of graphic transitions suggests an undercurrent of menacing psychology in scenes from commercial films of the early talkie and wartime era. And in Morning Came a Day Early, scientific films of the 1960s are revisited to ruminate on the riddle of the ruin the nature of time and destruction. The acme of his work in this mode, however, is the Demi Mond, a five hour double projection work of 35 millimeter film strips, digitally scanned and slowly dissolving into each other. The composition is of a rectangular strip of two consecutive frames. Kerr has distorted, decomposed, or otherwise distressed the emulsion of each frame to create abstract and occasionally non-objective imagery. For the most part, the root image remains. But in some instances, Kerr has created new symmetries within the image, or has reticulated the image so that it breaks down into strands of fraying viscera, revealing underlying patterns of emulsion. Kerr returned to his experiments in using the camera in tandem with other forms of machines with house arrest, in which he mounted a digital camera at the end of a power drill, giving an illusion that the camera can see 360 degrees. The image curves with the speed of the rotating drill bit. The wide angle of the camera lens bends along its curve the shapes that it encounters, skyscrapers, paint cans, a garden. At first, this act of abstraction forces the eye to recognize these objects. As house arrest continues, the root environment becomes less discernible as the drill speeds up and the resulting images metamorphose into mandalas. The power drill is again used in Holy Holy, not as a mount, but to make images by drilling directly into the film plane. Kerr drilled a hole into a roll of undeveloped film. He put it outside and let it soak up moonlight. In his final edit, the drill's holes are pitch black, with frayed brown-gold edges. 
In contrast to the blue and dark purple tone of the intact plastic base, Kerr digitally manipulated the results, slowing and staggering the rhythm in which this circle moves across the frame. The black puncture becomes a metaphoric opposite for the moon itself. The image is both a product of moonlight and a symbol of its absence. Field Trip, finished in 2021, is a culmination of Kerr's studies in the boundaries of material. This work was made from a personal archive of visual research gathered between 1980 and 1995 of photographs taken throughout the United States while Kerr was making films, among them The Last Days of Contrition and Cruel Rhythm. Kerr has crumpled and distressed the photographs, creating creases in the surface that become animated as he passes a light over them. Kerr's photographs bear an illusion of depth, but that depth is annihilated by the folds and creases, the highlights and shadows created by his handling of base materials, paper and light. Field Trip is an affirmation of Kerr's total project, a meeting of found images, found if only in one's own past, materiality, where the arcs and valleys of crumpled paper trump the printed grain of the snapshot, and social landscape, traces of American life, acts of witness after Robert Frank, from rust belt vistas to mundane gatherings to suggestions of jingoism and violence. The photograph is revealed as a construct the construct is further strained by staggering, unnatural color. Kerr has described this process as a reimagining. In a fog of dissolves, he breaks down the image into component parts of texture, content, color, speaking to the distance of time. 